I want to switch gears to a paper that you recently posted up on Archive, pre-trained transformers as universal computation engines. Uh, tell us a little bit about that work and what you're uh, looking to achieve there. Yeah, so this paper for me was it's one of the most surprising things we, we, we've done. Usually, usually I feel like when, when we write a paper, we have a pretty clear intuition and we know ahead of time okay, this intuition should be leveraged this way in the algorithm. And as a consequence, it, it should work and we should be able to take things to, to the next level. That That's a fairly typical research kind of progression. And sure, there's iterations because your intuition might be wrong, but then you refine your intuition and you improve the algorithm. But this is kind of surprising to me because here we didn't really, um, we didn't really come up with a new algorithm. It was really an investigation, right? So what we did is we, looked at pre-trained language models. So what's very popular these days is to, on massive amount of text, train a transformer model, which is specific architecture of, of neural network, um, to do next token prediction in a, in a document, right? And if you do this, it turns out it works really well on other language tasks. And that had been known in, in OpenAI, Google, Facebook, and so forth, many, many results uh, around this. But the thing we were wondering is, well, if it's so good at doing all these tasks, it wasn't really directly trained for, could there be something more general it has learned? When it's trained to predict the next token on so much text on the internet, by seeing the previous text, predict what comes next, might there be a more general reasoning mechanism that has been internalized inside this kind of neural network beyond language? And so the way we tested this, we said, okay, let's see if we train, we take a model, train on language only, not train on anything else. And then let's put it to use to now classify images or um, do a prediction about a protein sequence, um, binding protein sequence binding sites, or a, a simple math kind of problem, like compute the XOR of a sequence of bits. And none of these are language tasks. Obviously, mm -hmm. so you have to do a. You, you can't just put the language model in front of it because the language model only takes in language. You can't give it an image; doesn't know what to do. But the, we, so we they're have also to not. They're also not generative tasks. Like we've seen GPT three apply to right. lots of different areas, generating web pages from text. Mm -hmm. But they all share this common generative, um, you know, text based property. Exactly, they tend to be generate something like the things you have seen before, right? Mm -hmm. Text, right? So this model is all trained on text. We want, but we, we believed that there was a chance that it actually reasons in a more general way, that there's some kind of thing in the neural network that makes it reason about objects that are on its input and then draw conclusions on its output. And that maybe there are general reasoning patterns in there that if we use that reasoning engine, and put it in front of an image, it'll also reason about what's in the image and how these things might interact and so forth. Of course, you need to do a little bit of impedance matching. So we take the image, we have to do an embedding, which is just, we just do a linear embedding layer, which is you know, one layer can do almost no work for neural networks, right? That, that's the whole idea that we want that pre-trained language model to do all the work. So just a linear embedding layer, pre-trained language model, and then a linear output layer. Again, because we don't want to output words this time, we want to output a decision, what's in an image, or is this X or a zero or a one, or is this, uh, will there be a bind here for the protein or not? So just changing the output and input with just linear, single layer. And then one other thing we had to do, we had to do a, the normalization that happens inside the transformer network so there's layer normalization. We had to re, um, we had to effectively re, retrain that to make sure it's on the right scale for the data that comes through. Now, just doing that was enough to get surprisingly good performance on these other tasks. And so, to me, that was very surprising because it it confirmed that when you train this neural network on language it's actually not that specialized for language at all. If you train on enough language, it's actually internalizing some more general reasoning pattern. Of course, we don't fully understand this yet, but we have this observation here that it has internalized something that's very generally reusable. Um, and of course, we tested it. We said, what if we just put 
a random transformer in the middle. Um, sa same as the language model, but randomly initialized. So not trained on not language. Not trained. Same architecture, right? Mm -hmm. Randomly initialized. And it actually does something, which is kind of surprising that it's also kind of capable of doing something, but not as well as the pre-trained language model. So there is, it seems like there's both some power in the architecture being surprisingly powerful in general. And then there's additional power in what you learn on language transfers over to these other domains, which goes back to something that I mentioned at the very beginning, we talked about, you know, what, what am I excited about? And I mentioned this, this notion of, um, well, the human brain is so general and it seems like some part of the brain that's normally used for one kind of reasoning could be used for other things. Um, processing of signal from your tongue can apparently do visual processing. Um, people have seen this in, in, in blind people also that they're what well, normally a part of brain used for visual processing for blind people can be used for audio processing part of it. And so this kind of reusability generality, we're kind of seeing not, nothing like human brain, just to be clear. Human brain is completely not understood and, and way more advanced than anything we're working on here. But it's, it, you know, try to make progress in that direction of something mm. that's more general reasoning, not special purpose to a specific domain. Mm. When you talk about the random model and the, the pre-trained model uh, kind of sandwiched between these linear layers, are you you freezing the transformers and then fine tuning or training the linear layers for in a supervised manner for the specific problem? Is that the idea? Correct. So once you, once you have the supervised task, you freeze the transformer except for the layer norm parameters um, and the linear input and linear output layer. So those get retrained. So I think it's about like 0.1% or something of the overall parameter set mm -hmm. is being trained that way. Mm -hmm. And then when you say surprisingly good performance, does that mean state of the art on some task or we're surprised that it worked at all, but it's not particularly useful or state of the art? It wasn't state of the art. Um, I mean, it was state of it was state of the art in terms of this kind of research. I mean, beyond state of the art in terms of this kind of research where you're not allowed to train on the task you care about or not much, only those linear yeah. layers. In that sense, yes, absolutely state of the art. But in terms of, if you say I want the best in world, best in the world image classifier, right, right. Am I going to first train on language and then only have a linear layer in the input and the output to 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 work with? No, that's not not yet, or maybe we'll never. I don't know. Uh, give us uh, the the best in world image classifier. I just want to make sure I was not making assumptions on what surprisingly good meant. <laughs> uh, yeah, what I meant with surprisingly good is surprising that it even, you know, that it does much, much better than chance. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And where do you see this particular line of research going? What's What are the next steps? So, I, I think... There is a lot of opportunity in research on multimodal data. Um, and of course, the work I mentioned here is one work. Um, another work that stands out that I'm sure you, you've seen is the, the CLIP work by OpenAI, where they specifically trained at the same time on language and images. So it was trained mm -hmm. simultaneously on language and images, not just trained on one, and it also works on, on the other. Um, but that's often the case. Often you have access to multiple data modalities that are in some sense, not perfectly aligned necessarily, but you know, that are clearly related and you can co-train them. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I think there is a lot of, I mean, even, I mean, this could be audio and video that could be trained on at the same time. This could be text and images. This could maybe in, in you know, if you think about, robotics, the same things. It could be it could be audio, video, um, but it could maybe be also be sent someday if we have a better olfactory um, artificial sensors mm -hmm. and combine that with other percepts. I think there's a lot of opportunity to um, learn unified representations that could probably go further than when we train on each separately. Right, right. 